from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Honoring a legacy by keeping a tradition going. He had a passion. As we remember all who served and died fighting for our country. And he said he wanted to build a museum that would be a tribute to all the men he fought with. As war rages across the sea. Ukraine is fighting for their freedom, but they're also fighting for their lives. On this Memorial Day, right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. On this Memorial Day, we honor and remember those lost in service to our country. While half a world away, another war is continuing. One that is being fought with the front lines, sometimes being farmland. We're talking about Russia's war with Ukraine. An Illinois farmer and philanthropist, Howard G. Buffett, is working to help farmers in rural communities there survive and rebuild. In partnership with the German Marshall Fund in April, Buffett traveled to Oklahoma City to meet with farm groups and city business leaders as part of his multi-state whistle-stop tour for Ukraine. The motion to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. 815 is agreed to. When our allies are stronger, we are stronger. As President Biden signs the latest aid package for Ukraine, the war stretches into another month. With spring planning arriving, farmers there are struggling to maintain production, infrastructure, and markets. As a farmer, uh, when I when I travel across Ukraine and meet with farmers and go to farms, uh, it's pretty amazing to see the devastation. Howard G. Buffett has traveled to Ukraine on 11 different occasions to see for himself the challenges facing farmers in the region. Keeping, you know, fertilizer moving and, 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 and seeds moving and chemicals moving and, and uh, you know, even parts for, for tractors and combines. I mean, that value chain has to stay in place and, and be able to operate. And I think it's got more and more uh, stress on it today than it did, uh, you know, even last year. At last count, more than 85,000 pieces of farm equipment have been destroyed. And the State Emergency Service of Ukraine now says 25% of the nation's total land mass may contain explosives. Landmines are a significant issue across the country in terms of um, affecting agriculture and, and, and of course that affects the economy. During the conversation with agricultural leaders in Oklahoma, Buffett shared his view from the front lines. One of the things that is kind of um, disheartening to me as a farmer is if you look at the occupied areas that Russia has in Ukraine, uh, this last year uh, it was estimated that almost 28% of the wheat production in Ukraine came from those occupied areas. So you have Russia using farmers in those areas to actually fund the war uh, against Ukraine, which is, which is pretty hard to imagine, but it's happening. That wheat coming from Russia and Ukraine is an area of concern for Oklahoma wheat farmers in the room. You look at the export numbers from the Ukraine area, there's still a lot of wheat being shipped out of that area. So would, from your standpoint, do you feel that's just grain they have in storage from previous years that's being shipped out? Or do you think there's still a lot of wheat production going on in that country? I've been pretty shocked at the amount of wheat they've been able to ship out. Ukraine is probably selling grain at below the cost of production right now and they're doing it because they have no choice. Their cheap grain is putting us at an extreme disadvantage because their grain is competing against us. You know, people are simply trying to survive, and that's what they're trying to do. It was really enlightening for me to be as an Oklahoma leader to come to this meeting and hear what uh, Mr. Buffett had to say. And I don't get in my tractor to go plow the ground to worry about a landmine. These people have bigger problems. I think the takeaway today is it's an eye-opening to actually be able to talk to somebody that's had boots on the ground, been there in person, talking with the farmers, individuals over in Ukraine, and seeing the things they go through. As the war continues, the financial and logistical hardships are putting millions of farm families and businesses at risk. Ukraine can't give up. Ukraine doesn't have an option. I mean, Ukraine is fighting for their freedom, but they're also fighting for their lives. As the U.S. sends additional military aid, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation has given nearly $600 million in food, support, 
and equipment. It's one of the few times, you know, well, it's the only time, I would say, in my life uh, that, that I had to decide, you know, are we going to step up? And if we step up, you know, then we have to step up big. We all have a cause. What's your cause? What's my cause? Um, this is his cause. But what, what's your passion and what are you doing? And so, you know, to me, that maybe brings it to a little more home. From room to room, city by city, it's a message from the front lines where the view of the war's real cost hits home. If you want Ukraine to win, we have to give them what they need to win. We've given them enough to fight and die, but not enough to fight and win. Coming up, taking technology to the next level. We'll meet a maverick in the field, and later, a little tractor with a lot of memories, how it's helping to honor veterans this Memorial Day. Technology is changing farming in so many ways, and some farmers are embracing that change. We'll call them mavericks in the field. And Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan recently kicked off this latest series of reports in Casey, Illinois, with a farmer who's always thinking about what's next and how advanced tech could help their family farm reach new heights. With every pass and every turn, each move in this Illinois farm field is done hands-free. That's what I think really makes this great, is that you can do all this and you can focus more on just watching the planner. It's hints of automation Heath Husingay has fully embraced. And half the time, you know, I'll just sit, I sit sideways in here and I'm just, I don't have to worry about turning. Um, I know if I have an obstacle coming up, it'll tell me. This is the view from his office each spring and it gives a hint into how immersed he is into the technology available in the tractor and on the planter. I can watch my pops, I can watch my ground contact, I can watch all that good stuff. So it just frees me up to focus more on the actual planter itself than just focusing on driving the tractor. Modern conveniences that have opened a new realm of realities, some that you can't quantify with a true ROI. Some of the things that we do a little different, we're quick to embrace new theories, just embracing the unknown. Farming on the edge of innovation is seen as risky by some, but for Husingay, it's become the norm. Instead of looking at an entire farm field, he's focused pass by pass and row by row. With even the you know RTK, SF RTK systems, the ability to replicate that when I come here and plant beans next year, my beans are going to be right there. They're not going to be over here. They're not going to be over there. They're going to be right there in that row. So then it opens up my mind to the possibility of of when it comes to fertilizer and the options of, I'm not building up the whole field, I'm building up that strip. I'm not gonna farm this, you know, 30 inches in between. I'm farming that right there. He's also growing more precise in how he farms, but he's still willing to push the boundaries and try new things. Actually, just over here on this 40, I had this wild hair. I had read this report that guys were doing skip row corn, and I thought, you know what, we're gonna, make this work. So I think I planted two rows, turned one off, two rows, turned one off, two rows, turned one off, all the way across the planter. But I wanted to adjust my pop so that it was the same as me where I would have been planting 35,000 across the planter. And luckily deer, I went in there and figured out how to shut the rows off and up certain rows and lower the other ones. So that was great. Um, you know, I was planting 45 to 50,000 on those two rows and then skipping the row. He says that one trial then brought on a load of questions. We actually had some commercial guys call and say, hey, I think you had a problem. You know, you're spraying the field next to it over here. You might want to go fix that. I said, oh, that, that, that was on purpose. A wild idea that actually worked. It made like five more bushel than the test, but I haven't given up on it. I think it was maybe the wrong hybrid that I tried with it. So probably gonna try that again. All right, thanks, Tyne. Now coming up, what do you think of when you hear the words sustainable ranching? We'll head to one ranch in Texas where sustainability is at the heart of everything they do. As 
Agriculture continues to transition into a new era of climate smart systems. Farm Journal's Trust in Food division is working with beef producers to develop sustainable production systems. And as part of that journey, those producers can participate in a nationwide tour highlighting industry leading operations. Now, Farm Journal's Michelle Rook takes us to Texas, which was the first stop on the tour. The dream for the ranch started nearly 40 years ago when GC Ellis purchased the first 450 acres near Roston, Texas. Over time, over that 40 year time span, it's grown to about 3,000 acres. And so I'm the second generation that's on the ranch that's trying to come along and learn from my dad and our ranch manager. Today, the Ellis family is focused on continuous improvement through regenerative grassland and range management that fosters biodiversity. The challenge is the ranch is on the convergence of two broad ecological regions with thin and deep soil types. But with technical assistance from NRCS, they've developed an adaptive grazing system that promotes soil health. What we need to do as managers is do a good job grazing those plants to make the plants more healthy and in turn those plants feed the microbes and in return for that those microbes make more plant nutrients available so it's a cycle that it, it keeps expanding over time and making the operations more sustainable the well-being of their cattle is also the key to a better meat product and so the g bar c ranch focuses on low stress handling animal health and nutrition the better we eat, the better we're probably going to feel. Same thing with an animal. If we are more sustainable and if we can handle our cattle better, they will respond to vaccines better. They will respond to uh, treatments better. They will perform better. These regenerative and climate smart practices help GBARC and other ranches build resilience and stay in business during three consecutive years of drought in Texas. So soil health in a sense, drought proofs our ranches. If our soil is healthy, it can take in more water, so we have a higher effective rainfall, and we have healthier plants that are better able to withstand the drought. They have this conservation ethic and this, this will, will being in themselves that they're wanting to give back, um, not only to their family and operation, but all Texans. And being able to keep it as a whole and being able to provide you know, beef and, and other products, but also the clean water and clean air and open space uh, is very important to them. A goal that benefits the entire food chain from producer to consumer. I'm Michelle Work reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Well, a lot of people think you need to head to the nation's capital in order to honor veterans and those lost in fighting wars. Up next, we head to Memorial and Museum in the heart of the Midwest that started with a prayer. It started as a prayer from a soldier during World War I, and it has grown into a memorial and museum to honor all who served the U.S. in conflict. This morning, in honor of Memorial Day, we take you to a museum near Fort Wayne, Indiana, where no veteran will ever be forgotten. Amid the fire and flash of battle in World War I, an 18-year-old Eric Scott focused on the future. And he was really in the throes of a lot of fire, a lot of guys getting killed, blood and guts. And he looked up in the sky and he told God, he says, God, if you get me out of this, I'm going to make sure that no veteran will ever be forgotten. He survived life in the trenches, living up to his promise when he returned home. He said he wanted to build a museum that would be a tribute to all the men he fought with. With the help and support of his wife, Cleo. Scott buying a 40 acre farm near Fort Wayne, Indiana, turning it into a testament for all who serve. In 1951, he built the first museum here. Most items that originally were, were all World War I items from the World War I vets themselves because they were all part of the same unit, so they started having their reunions out here. Followed by more development as donations came in, including a retired traveling version of the Vietnam War Memorial, a healing spot for some. And there are a lot of guys we know locally here that you won't get too close to the wall. It just brings up too much emotion, so they'd rather stay back a bit. And they're slowly making their way closer and closer to the wall to actually see the names on them because, you know, it is a 
lot to take in. There's 58,800 plus names on that wall. It helped me put closure to the war. And I think that it does that for a lot of people. They, they call it a healing wall, but it's more than that. That gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction to know that maybe we've helped somebody deal with the effects of, of what war, the bad part of war, which is the loss of a loved one. The museum holds mementos and memories from all U.S. wars going as far back as the Revolutionary War and including some unique items from the Civil War. One of the more unusual items, of course, that we just acquired was the Medal of Honor from the Civil War. And what's unique about it is the Civil War medals are different than the ones you see now. They could only be pinned on the uniform. It even features a boxcar, a thank you gift from France after World War II, one of the so-called 40 and 8. And these boxcars held either 40 soldiers or eight horses. That's where the 40 and 8 came from. They call it the mercy car because they wanted to thank the U.S. for the defending against the Nazis during World War II. From the battlefield to a former farm field. Any holiday where patriotism is involved, we're here. And we're here to share our experiences. Continuing to honor those lost. This museum is dedicated to everybody to come and learn about every veteran, what they've done, what they've gone through. And we call it our memorial park. So I think the main theme it will always be, no veteran will ever be forgotten. Parades are a big part of so many small towns on Memorial Day. I'm next, a little tractor and a ride from the man behind it who has a very big heart to keep a tradition going. A tiny John Deere tractor is making a big statement this Memorial Day. Farm Journal photojournalist Mike Byers has a look at this historic tractor that is honoring veterans and a legacy of friendship. What we have here is a 1925 John Deere Model E hit and miss tractor. It's riding on a 1964 wheel horse chassis. It's one of 14 that was built back in the late 70s and early 80s. It was built by a, a good friend of mine and his father, uh, Roger Tenney, and his dad, Hugo. Uh, they began in 1963, and they just had a passion for hit and miss engines and wanted a good way to take them to shows and display them. Hugo came up with a, a way of mounting these engines on a tractor chassis to make them a little bit easier to move around and drive them and uh, ultimately make them a better display piece. Roger and I go way back. I had known him about 25 years. He started to fall into declining health. He sadly passed away on uh, April 12th of this year. But June of last year was the classic green reunion. The Model E hit and miss engines were the feature, one of the features that they had down there. So I knew that Roger still had this tractor and uh, I asked him one day if I could take that tractor down and show it there on his behalf. And over the course of this past winter, I took it and completely disassembled it. I sandblasted everything that needed to be down to bare metal and gave it a professional level restoration and uh, continue to show it on his behalf and uh, hope to continue to do so. Well, Roger had a little club that called itself the Americana Antique Engine Society. And today it's defunct, but Roger was the self-proclaimed leader of it and did a good job. Today in parades and shows, uh, I still carry around the, the sign and the banner that say American Antique Engine Society in his memory. He had a passion, and that passion was preserving the, the industrial history of our nation. He wanted to pass this on to the next generation, and that's something that, that I feel is extremely important. And I do this for him. His spirit lives on with this tractor. And so help me, I will show it as long as I can. 
And our thanks to Mike Byers for that story. Now that tractor will roll in the Memorial Day Parade in Mishawaka, Indiana. And that's all the time that we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.